Well, if you would open up to Daniel, the fifth chapter, and that's where we're going to be studying tonight. Uh, I personally find Daniel to be such an interesting book. I don't know, maybe because I've got that name, but I, I find it to be a, such an interesting book. Just a couple of things I want to mention as we begin our class. Remember I said when we first started this book that in the Hebrew text, it's with the group of what we call the wisdom literature. And of course, with our uh, English text, it's in what we call the books of prophets. And so I see there's many things in this text, and I think chapter five will bear this out, that are very wise and they're, they're appeal to our understanding and appeal to us so people can understand, can observe things and can understand. So it's very much a book of prophecy and a book of wisdom literature is what, what I think Daniel is because who's the group of people that's in every chapter so far that they keep looking for? The wise men. Uh, and we keep finding the bad wise men and the good wise men. And the bad ones are always based in, in the Babylonian tradition and the good ones are always based uh, in the, the tradition of, of knowing the Lord. And so that, and so I think from that perspective alone, it's a, it's a book of, uh, of wisdom literature. Where we are tonight, the first four chapters have all been under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king that the Babylonian empire, empire had. Uh, and what we're going, and, and so many of the things that uh, we've seen so far, particularly the first three chapters, uh, were when Daniel was young. He and his friends were young. The fourth chapter we suspect was, maybe he's a little older, but he's not, we don't suspect he's real old in the fourth chapter. But the fifth chapter, Daniel is probably in his 80s, time we get to the fifth chapter approaching maybe even 90 years old, because this is going to be the end of the Babylon. That's how I can date that, because it's near the end of the Babylonian Empire. So Daniel spans from the beginning of, of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, all the way through Nebuchadnezzar, to the end of the Babylonian Empire. So now Daniel's an old man when we, uh, when we get to the, uh, the fifth chapter. Uh, another couple of things I want to just note here in kind of a background one of the things we have seen in every chapter, well, let me ask you, what has been one of the prominent ideas in every chapter so far? Who's the ruler? God's the ruler. You know, Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's the ruler, you know, but God is the ruler. And that's, again, very prevalent in this chapter, right? We've got Belshazzar, who thinks he's in charge, but God is ultimately in charge. And so we've seen that in every chapter so far. So that's one of the prominent ideas of the book of Daniel. Why do you suppose that is significant in the book of Daniel? Okay. The children of God, the nation of Israel are captive by the Babylonians. It looks like the king of Babylon is the ruler because he decides, you know, where they live and all these things. But the message is God is the ruler. And from that perspective, I think that's a great lesson for us today is that God is still the ruler, no matter what politics looks like. God is, God is the ruler. Uh, in the first three chapters, we see that, that idea developed over and over again. And the Nebuchadnezzar should have been learning based on his experiences in the first three chapters. Now, Kevin covered chapter four last week. And what did we, we learn about Nebuchadnezzar in chapter four prior to the, his experience? Up, coming up, starting chapter four, where was Nebuchadnezzar on his lesson that God's in charge? He had, he had failed at that, hadn't he? He had, he had had all the evidence of chapter one, two, and three, and there was ample evidence that God is in charge in those chapters. 
when we got to chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar made that statement. Look what I have done with the power that I have with my hand. And then uh, God humbled him. Now, the beauty of God, of Nebuchadnezzar being humbled is he repented and he makes that. There is no greater statement in the book of Daniel about the magnitude of God and his ruling than what Nebuchadnezzar makes after he's been humbled. He sees that God is, is that. Now, we come, I, I went through all of that. We're going to get to Belshazzar tonight. Belshazzar, uh, the fifth chapter here, it talks about him, Daniel being his father, or not Daniel, but uh, Nebuchadnezzar being his father, or he being the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, historically, he is not the direct son of Nebuchadnezzar. We can go back and look at history, and we can see the kings uh, that, that came, and, and Belshazzar was not, but he is son in the sense that I'm the son of Ulysses Byers, who was my grandfather. And we know we talk about the prophecy of David's son. Jesus asked that question. How did he call him Lord if he's his son? So he's, he's Nebuchadnezzar's lineage. And so he should have been looking up to Nebuchadnezzar as one to honor and respect uh, what Nebuchadnezzar did. So I, I just want to mention that up front is a clarification on that. Uh, that's really significant because we're going to see in this chapter that he probably grew up in Nebuchadnezzar's house. And we're going to also see he probably knew of Nebuchadnezzar's grace eating experience. Now, I think that's to me, this is, this is one of the pieces of wisdom literature of this chapter. Have you ever witnessed something that you should have learned from that you didn't? Somebody else's mistakes that you should have learned from. I think that's one of the core things of this chapter and one of the lessons that we need to take away from that. When we see mistakes of others, we need to observe those and learn something from that. And that's what we're going to see in this. Uh, another little thing I want to mention uh, as we get into this, uh, his father was a, was a fellow named Nabonidus. Nabonidus apparently married the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar and got to be uh, uh, king through some of that relationship. And Nabonidus was still alive when Belshazzar was reigning as king. But Nabonidus did not want to be apparently in Babylon. He wanted to be out seeking adventure other places. And also he had developed a admiration for the moon god. And so he wanted to go to the temples of the moon god and that upset the prophets because the god of Babylon was Marduk and the prophets of Babylon got upset with, with the bottom dust. And so he was kind of exiled. And so Belshazzar reigns under his father and that's going to become significant when he starts giving gifts. He's going to give Daniel the option of the third place in the kingdom because he only positioned himself was the second place. And but that's that's why of course, and most of the time Nabonidus was away from was away from Babylon in the later years when Belshazzar was ruling. But also something else I, I learned from reading some of the uh, history historical background. There's quite a bit written about Belshazzar and, and Nabonidus in, in some, uh, they found a lot of cuneiform clay tablets. That was their common form of writing. And there's quite a bit recorded about the two of them in these tablets and, and by some ancient historians too, because Babylon was a great empire. And so some of the ancient historians talked about Babylon, but they call Belshazzar evil, 
Belshazzar. And so it's just, this is not just something that happened as, as a whim one night. This apparently was the characteristic of his life, was that he was an evil king, uh, a, a, an evil one. So those are just some of the uh, uh, things to uh, learn from history. Also, a few days before the events of chapter five, based on the historic record, not, not based on the scriptures, Nabonidus lost a battle to Cyrus that basically destroyed the Babylonian army about 50 miles from Babylon. So you think you're in Babylon, you're Belshazzar, your father has lost a major battle and destroyed the Babylonian army. You've got this news in Babylon and that's when these events take place. So I think that puts this kind of in, in, a, in a light that they're already, they're distressed in Babylon because they, uh, uh, these events have happened. And one other thing that we can note from chapter eight, uh, the book of Daniel is not in chronological, chronological order. Chapter eight is, is written from a vision that Daniel has in the third year of Belshazzar's reign. Well, in chapter eight, Daniel has the vision that the Medes are going to conquer Babylon. So Daniel already knows before the handwriting on the wall that the Medes are going to take Babylon out. Now, I don't know if he shared that with anybody, but he already knows that. So Daniel is indeed the, is the uh, one who uh, sits in a wise uh, position. So those are just... Uh, kind of some things that uh, I, I noticed were interesting, kind of helped set the stage here when we go into, into the, uh, this chapter. And so we have this, we're here in Babylon, the gates are all shut up because the Medes and the Persians are out here. The, the army has been decimated. Uh, some of them have come back, I guess, escaped back to the city. The, the city is shut up. Babylon itself had two concentric walls around it that were well fortified and they felt very confident that they were impregnable inside of this, of this fortress that they, they lived, uh, that they were in. Uh, and so I'm gonna begin with now chapter five, verse one. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. He was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold, the silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. So the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels they had taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and stone. Now, it doesn't say exactly why they went and got these things, but I, I don't think it's, uh, or, or why they were having this feast. But I don't think it's a far stretch for us to think that it's related to the time of distress they're in. And now they're going to worship their idol god. And for some reason, they decide to diminish Jehovah God in, in trying to elevate their idol gods. To me, that's the story that's going on here. He purposely goes and gets these things that belong to Jehovah God and uses them in his festival or feast to worship his idol gods, probably in requesting protection from his idol gods. Now, what's upside down about that? Eddie? One of the things we, that seems clear in the implication here is Nebuchadnezzar had never done this right. himself. And, and I suspect that was probably true about all the nations they've conquered before. He was the only God that we care about right. in, in the story. Whereas Belshazzar, 
to, to me, it's fascinating. You've got the enemy army camp around your city, and you're having a drunken feast. Mm -hmm. That that tells us what kind of a person he was. And, and to be calling upon these gods of nations that you have conquered to protect you, it is. It's upside down. And completely upside down. And especially since he knew, because Daniel's going to, you know, charge him with that, you knew that your father Nebuchadnezzar had been humbled by Jehovah God. And so it's, it's blatantly irresponsible and arrogant for him to do that and total disregard for who God is, for who Jehovah God is. And so I, I think that's important for us to see here that, that Belshazzar is one that has no respect for God, Jehovah God. Yeah, Eddie? Adam talked about that he was teaching from the book of Leviticus, the idea that God is holy. Okay. That's what the entire message of Leviticus was about. God is holy. Israel needs to recognize God is holy. Well, Shaz is being really optimal that he's making God unholy. He's making him common. Make, yep. And he's making him less than the idol gods, is what, he, what he's doing. But the only one who could save him, he blasphemes, he belittles. And so I, I think that shows somewhat of his evil nature. Uh, and, and his, his character as he does this in a, in a total res, disrespect for Jehovah God. Now, remember, the theme of the book is who rules? God rules. And so it doesn't take us long to figure out this is not going to turn out good for Belshazzar because God rules. Okay, other thoughts there? Five through nine. Now, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. And the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. I think that is one of the most comical verses in the Bible. Uh, you see this complete emotional change in, in the man here. Here he is being so disrespectful. He's throwing this drunken party, and... The moment he realizes what he's done, it's just, how would you stand before God? And I think that would be all of us. Our face would go pale. Our thoughts would change. He had arrogant thoughts. He talks about his hip joints got loose and his knees, his knees knocked together. Those are kind of some terms that we use, right, if we, we get intimidated. Well, I not only want to think about Belshazzar with us. I want to think about us. Have you ever realized you did something you shouldn't have done and you're going to be held accountable for it? Can you feel a little bit like Belshazzar here? I think that he now realizes that this God that he has blasphemed he doesn't understand what he's saying, but he's realized this God he's blasphemed is now speaking to him. Uh, the king called aloud to bring the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. And all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation of the king. Then King Be uh, Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. Called the wrong group of people again. All the Babylonian wise men, they have failed on every occasion that they've been summoned. They, they have failed uh, in that. Now, 10, 10 through 12. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There's a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. 
And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, appointed him chief of all the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems was found in this Daniel, whom the king named Bel Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Now, it talks about the queen, and I don't think this is the, the wife of Belshazzar, but this is probably his mother, the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, she for sure would have witnessed Nebuchadnezzar eating grace. And she would have witnessed Daniel being a advisor to Nebuchadnezzar all these years of Nebuchadnezzar was king. And what is she? She's a believer in God, would you say? I, she may believe in the idols too, but she has some faith in God here and Daniel's association with God. What does she say about Daniel? The spirit of the holy gods is in this, this individual. She at least recognizes he is a, a wise man, a source of understanding. And so she calls uh, or asks or tells Belshazzar uh, to invite or to summons Daniel after all the, the failure with the, um, with the other wise men. Okay, any thoughts down through that part of the lesson? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. She was not a part of the party. Yeah, and we don't know why she wasn't there, but she was not a part of the party. Daniel wasn't a part of the party. Uh, I think that's a good, a good point. This party, as best we can tell, was a party that none of us should ever be a part of because it was a drunken feast. And so uh, probably all sorts of things that go on a drunken feast were going on there. But she was not there, but she did, she did hear that and came in with the good advice. Okay. okay, let's look at 13 through 17 now. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. This king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that an illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription, it makes interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you're able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you're able to read the inscription, and make its interpretation known to me. You will be clothed with purple, wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as a third ruler in the kingdom. My text is still a common word. Problem in verse 16, common enigma, which I think is okay. You see something right on the wall. It's like a puzzle. Okay. Yeah, that's different translation use a different word there. But it's it's something that, that they could not understand uh, written on the wall. A couple of things I want to notice in this section here. One is uh, uh, Belshazzar addresses Daniel and he addresses him as a slave. What had been Daniel's position in the kingdom when Nebuchadnezzar was there? He was Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man. But do you get the idea that Belshazzar has, has now demoted Daniel to an insignificant position 
remember, and, and considering him a slave is why he's not available or he, had, he didn't consider asking him something. You kind of get that impression, don't you? That he is not recognizing him as the chief advisor that he was to Nebuchadnezzar. Something's happened there. You think he was ever actually, you know, even though he was promoted up, he still considered a captive slave. Well, he was he was probably considered a captive slave, but he was uh, he was a chief advisor to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And so, I don't know, it just seems like Belshazzar here has diminished his regard for Daniel, is what it appears in, to me in this uh, reading here. Now, he's heard this from the queen, the things he's heard, I've heard about, about you. And probably, as we can see down here in verse uh, uh, 21, uh, well, let's see, it was verse, we'll see a little later in the reading here, and I don't see the verse right now, where Daniel's going to tell him, you already knew these things. Uh, and but so he should have known about Daniel, he should have known about his position, his understanding, and allowed him to be his advisor. But the idea is that Belshazzar had turned his back on Daniel and, and on the advice that comes from God. Anything else down through 16 there? Okay, verse 17 says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to somebody else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. Why do you suppose Daniel said that? One is, we see a very different attitude that Daniel has toward Belshazzar than he did toward Nebuchadnezzar. Right. And I think that's because he could see a different heart. Both of them were extremely arrogant. Both of them thought they were in charge. Both of them were deadly wrong. And Daniel knew that. But he could see in Nebuchadnezzar a heart that was willing to listen. With Belshazzar, he's not willing to listen. And then secondly, he knows that Belshazzar won't be here tomorrow. Right. Well, he's, he's already had that vision. It's in chapter eight. And plus, if he comes in and sees the writing on a wall, he's probably already read it. And I think he, I, I like I think that's a really good point. What did he say to Nebuchadnezzar whenever he understood Nebuchadnezzar's dream before he told Nebuchadnezzar the answer? Here he tells Belshazzar, "Keep your keep your gifts. I don't I don't want them." What did it tell Nebuchadnezzar? You remember? And I think that illustrates the point that he's making here. He's, he says, may it happen to your enemies. So that, sh that indicated a fond reaction relation with Nebuchadnezzar. And here we have, I don't want this relation. It's, it's not, a, not a beneficial relationship here, what you're offering, offering me. Of course, he knows it's not going to last till morning anyway. So, yeah. We see that with Jesus also. There were times where Jesus was dealing with people who were sinners, mm -hmm. and yet he shows the compassion for them. The rich young ruler, he came up and wanted to work with them, he paid her life. When he left, Jesus still felt compassion for him. Jesus was sorrowful when he left. And yet Herod says, I want to see a sign. Jesus said, We'll tell that fox. Yep. <laughs> And so I, 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 so I do think that Daniel has sees that there's, there's, there's no sincerity and there's no, uh, no, really what he's offering here, he cannot deliver because it's going to be gone before the morning. Now, 18 through 21, I think is the key to the, to me is the, is kind of the center of chapter five is Daniel's discussion. And this, I consider a piece of wisdom literature. Uh, 18 through uh, 21. And Daniel begins to speak. He says, O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language 
feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive, and whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. And he was driven away from mankind. His heart was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like, like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he sets over it whomever he wishes. He uh, calls to mind what Belshazzar should already know, what he has already seen. And he calls to mind, here's the experiences of your father, Nebuchadnezzar. And as he's going to say here in verse 13, or verse 23, even though you knew all of this, you knew what God did with Nebuchadnezzar and you still acted the way you've acted. And I think there's a, to me, there's a lesson for every one of us in this. We do not need to ever think that, that we can reject the examples or the observations we see in other people and things are gonna turn out good for us. When we see people do things that are evil, and we think we can follow in their paths and it's going to be better for us than it was for them. We're being foolish like Belshazzar was. He ignored the lessons that he learned. Now, uh, another, I think, great lesson in this, this section here, he describes Nebuchadnezzar in, and I think in, in some, to me, very powerful terms because he said he, he bestowed a, because of the grandeur which he bestowed upon him and all the peoples, uh, uh, nations and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. Whomever he wished, he spared alive. Whomever he wished, he elevated. Whomever he wished, he humbled. <coughs> What's he saying about Nebuchadnezzar there? He gave Nebuchadnezzar control. This is very much the same statement we see made about Adam in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden. He was made ruler of all. We saw this statement was made to Nebuchadnezzar, that God has made you ruler of all. I think that's the idea here. God had made Nebuchadnezzar ruler of all, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud, he behaved arrogantly. When Nebuchadnezzar did not respect that rule and his accountability to God for that rule, then God humbled him. That seems to be the, the point. I think that's a lesson to me. That's why I think this is the heart of the, of the chapter of these verses here, and I think the lesson for us. Yes, Dempsey? Yes, to, to uh, say that in verse 20, Not humble your part. And then he also uh, touched on this. You know, you have a good influence, a good impact upon the queen. And she she chose because of her heart to be a good witness of Daniel and what he had done. And then you could say, because she's a Gentile, she's a hostile witness. Mm -hmm. you know, she's not a Jew. She's a hostile witness, and she's saying good about him. Uh, the Jews would, of course, say good about him. But here is a Gentile, and she's saying good about him, which you know, definitely says something about her heart. But you just, if you think about the message, and, and here is, and Daniel says, you do, you do. Uh, you, you can preach the same message to 100 people, and you may get 10, 5 that will accept the message. And say that's a good message. I want to hear more, and the rest go away for whatever reason. And it's the heart. 
It comes down to the heart again of the individual. Um, Acts 17 falls in Thessalonica, and some obey, some, but a lot of them are hostile. It goes down to Berea, yeah, but a large number that obey there, but it's a different heart. Mm -hmm. Same message, but it's a different heart. And uh, it, it just shows, you know, when, when we preach a message, teach a class, you, you have a lot of hearts that you're teaching to. And you teach the word of God and leave it up to the word to sift those hearts. We just need to stay with the word and let the word sift. It'll do its job. Uh, and it determines the kind of heart we are. And so <clears throat> I think there's all kinds of lessons we can, can teach and learn from these, these few verses. Here, because it, as Dem said, it's about our heart. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar responded because he he was tender to the, uh, because he was humbled by God. His heart changed. Belshazzar does not because his heart is hardened against God, and that hardness has been demonstrated by him going getting those vessels out of his out of his storehouse and drinking out of them and blaspheming to God that he does not have a humble heart to God. Also, I think in, in contained in this, God has made people rulers, but he will judge them for their heart and their ruling. And that, that applies to us as parents, husbands and wives, as Bible class teachers, as personal workers. God has made us these things, but he's going to judge our hearts and how we apply ourselves in it. Whether we do it arrogantly, elevating ourselves, or whether we do it humbly serving him. And that's, I think that's his point in this section here. Uh, God made Nebuchadnezzar ruler, and he had the power of life and death of individuals. But when he, when he elevated himself, and lifted himself up and said, oh, this is my power, then God humbled him. And so in verse 22, you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this thing. You knew that God humbled Nebuchadnezzar and you would not be humbled, is, is the point there. But you exalted yourself against the Lord God of heaven and you brought the vessels of his house before you and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of, 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 of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not uh, see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand are your, your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. So uh, you've exalted yourself to the place of God and you've brought God down and you've got it upside down. Uh, in verse 23, I think it indicates he has done this uh, purposely. And uh, you exalt yourself against the Lord God of heaven. When you brought those vessels in here, you knew what you were doing. You were disrespecting God and you knew it. And you were saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, do we ever disrespect God? by doing what we want to do. And, and I think that's a, a lesson for us there. Okay. Any? The last phrase there, verse 23, he says, The God who holds your life breath in his hand, you have not glorified. As Dempsey pointed out this morning, Paul echoes those words to the Ephesians. 
the God in whom we live and move and have our being. You know, we have to recognize God has given ample evidence, even to these Gentiles, that He holds their life in His hands. Okay. I think your your allusion back to Adam a second ago is just so apropos through this whole section. There's so many hyperlinks back to the garden. I mean, you think about yes, He gave him everything, he gave Adam everything, and put him over everything. And put the fear of Adam in everything. And yet, when his heart was exalted and his spirit became arrogant, his glory was <laughs> taken from him and he was driven away. Okay. That's, I mean, that's the Garden of Eden. And then down there, what Eddie just mentioned, the God who holds your life breath in his hand. I mean, he, he literally gave Adam the breath of life. And then it's that same hand that takes everything away. Just so many hyperlinks back to creation and then every story of pride in the Bible over and over again of people trying to usurp what God set in order and then him bringing them low. And I mean, we, you know, then, then you go to places like Romans chapter one, where it says people exchange the glory of God for a lie living like animals, essentially, and he gave them over to a debased mind. That's exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, only Nebuchadnezzar repents, Belshazzar does not. And just like Jesus would say, your very life will be required for you this evening. Yeah. Yes, I, I think the, the several times in the book of Daniel, he, he links back to, every time he talks about ruler, he links back to the idea of Adam being the first king or ruler, and God gave him that and how he failed at that. And that's what he's, uh, they've done here. One of the things that uh, I think is, uh, we're going to see it again in the book, and I'll, I'll quit tonight, uh, is the idea of Adam was created in the image of God. And I know last week you looked at Nebuchadnezzar what image was he in when he was eating grass? He was the Im image of an animal. Why was he in the image of an animal? Because Nebuchadnezzar had, had lowered himself from the image of God in his rulership and taken on the image of an animal, a vicious animal in his rulership. So God said, you live like the animal you've become. You're now the image of an animal. And we're going to see that, I think, in these next few chapters and these visions. We're going to see these empires are shown as visions, and these visions are shown as animals and not as in the image of God. And so I, I think that links back to the, the first uh, of the, uh, the book is that Nebuchadnezzar had become, he had become an animal rather than being the image of God. But God had made him like Adam a ruler. And so rulers often act like animals. They become animals. They don't, they don't fulfill the image that they've been appointed to. And Belshazzar does not fulfill the image of the ruler that God gave him. God gave him rulership, but he did not fulfill that image in the image of God. Um, well, I'm going to close there so we uh, don't go too long tonight. We ha we'll have the interpretation. We'll make a few comments on that. I think we've uh, talked mostly about the, the, the things I wanted to cover here in chapter five. So go ahead and be studying chapter uh, six uh, next week. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah,